Baltimore Book Festival, Woo! to the Red Emma's Radical Book Fair Pavilion at the Baltimore Book Festival for the six year running. All right, yes, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. She's a phenomenal author and a phenomenal activist. Started at least her authorship with a book helping to tell a woman's story from Honduras about the um, the siege of democracy that happened there since then, I think. I don't know the timeline super well, um, but helped to found Code Pink and Global Exchange, um, which is a international human rights organization. In the 90s, she was doing work against sweatshops and helping to raise people's awareness about the crippling effects of sweatshops on communities around the world and how we're complicit in that here by wearing clothes that are made in sweatshops and has recently in the last few years turned her attention on drones. Drones are to a large degree created in Baltimore at the Applied Physics Laboratory in Johns Hopkins. So we have a direct connection to that here um, and Medea's done really amazing work, both researching, really listening to people whose lives have been impacted and sometimes destroyed by these drones, and also directly confronting people who are responsible for that in a really important way, and, and trying to get them to be honest about what those drones are really doing and how they're really affecting people. So we're incredibly lucky to have Medea with us today. Without further ado. Well, thank you so much to Red Emma's, and it's really great to be at this book fair on such a beautiful day. I am actually feeling very positive these days because we saw something that I'd never seen before in my lifetime, which is American people rising up and saying no to a U.S. invasion of Syria. So I do a lot of traveling, and during the Bush years, people would always say, why did the American people elect George Bush? I said, well, you know, I don't know. Uh, then the second time Bush was selected, um, travel around and people say, with the terrible things that George Bush did, does, how could people have voted for him again? And I would say, well, look at the media we have and the corrupt two-party system and be making excuses for the American people all the time. I think there was a lot of excitement around the world when Barack Obama was elected, thinking that this was going to be a transformative time in the U.S., particularly around foreign policy, unfortunately didn't quite work out that way. Um, but the American people have for so long listened to the war makers, uh, been caught up in the whole cycle of fear, and oftentimes were in favor of wars that we shouldn't have gone into. And so to see when President Obama tried to sell yet another U.S. military intervention, the response from the American people was extraordinary. And I felt so proud of the American people for standing up on all sides of the political spectrum and being very clear, saying no. And the term has been used that the American people are war weary, and that is certainly true, but I think there's something else involved there, is the American people are more war wise, understanding that these past 11 years have been disastrous, that the amount of money that we've spent on these invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq and the other war making we've been doing have contributed to the financial crisis that the American people are saying we can't afford these kind of follies anymore, and recognizing that they just aren't working. I mean, if they were working after 11 years, there wouldn't be Al-Qaeda anymore, right? And uh, supposedly, Al-Qaeda is bigger than it was. So uh, something is amiss, and Americans are catching on to it. Now, certainly there were those people, politicians and individuals who said, 
If Obama is for it, I'm against it, no matter what it is. <laughs> you know? uh, if maybe it had been a Republican who was trying to push that, maybe they'd say, okay. But for, I would think, the majority of people, it really was a genuine sentiment of we have seen where this road leads us and we don't like it. And we, uh, as Code Pink, got immediately involved in trying to mobilize against a U.S. attack. My partner here, Ty Berry, set up a 24-7 encampment right outside of Congress and were there every single day as Congress people would come back and forth from their offices uh, to the Capitol and we would really bird dog them, like literally running after them. How are you going to vote for this? The American people don't want more war. Come on, you know, stand up for what the, your constituents are saying. We would go into their offices and you'd hear the ideological spectrum when you go in the office, because you know, in one place it might be uh, the uh, a receptionist saying, yes, I will tell the congressperson that you don't want to see a war with Syria and you want to defund Obamacare. Thank you for calling. <laughs> and then in another office they'd say, uh, yes, we understand you don't want to go to war with Syria and we understand you want that money to be used instead for universal health care and uh, education and things that people really need. So it, it, was, a, it was an incredible spectrum. Uh, there were Tea Party events going on at the exact time that had been pre-planned. Uh, they were um, uh, against uh, Obamacare, and they added into that, and were against an attack on Syria, and they came by our, our encampment and they'd say, uh, can we have our picture taken with Code Pink? Because we never thought we'd live to see the day where we agreed with Code Pink on <laughs> anything. It was quite extraordinary, and it is quite extraordinary still. I was interviewed today by a journalist, and he said, well, you've got to admit that it was uh, uh, President Obama's threat of force that made the Syrians agree to uh, enter into this process. And we said, uh, no, we don't have to agree with that analysis. If it hadn't been for the American people immediately, spontaneously rising up against this, we would be at war with Syria right now because the President said that was his red line and by gosh, he was going to do it. But it's when he started feeling, uh-oh, I better get the backing of Congress for this one, and opened it up for that, and then saw that the Congress people were actually getting an earful in their districts back home and, and the, the calls, and recognized that they just did not have the votes. First they thought they definitely had it in the Senate, not the House, and then they realized they didn't even have it in the Senate. They decided, all right, we're not going to take a vote. And that's when the diplomacy started to kick in. It is also amazing to see right now with the issue around Iran, because for so many years there's been so much rattling of the sabers around Iran, and including in that as part of this thing of we have got to force the Iranians uh, not to build a nuclear weapon, even though they say they're not building a nuclear weapon, but as part of that is to tighten the sanctions and tighten the sanctions and really uh, cripple the economy of Iran, which never hurts the leadership, it hurts the ordinary people. And when the Iranian people did an extraordinary thing, which was elect the most moderate person who was on the ticket, uh, instead of Congress saying, wow, this is great, now let's really start uh, peace talks, uh, they passed a, uh, uh, an amendment that said that we are going to tighten the, the sanctions even further. So come the UN uh, this week, and we see the Iranian head of state there speaking in a very conciliatory fashion, and we see the uh, Secretary of, of State, John Kerry, who just two weeks before could have been renamed Secretary of War for the way he was trying to bring us into a war with, the, uh, with Syria, is now sitting down with the Foreign Minister of Iran, and diplomacy is starting to take its course with Iran as well. So it has been an extraordinary couple of weeks. And I think this is a momentum that we have to keep building on. It's in a momentum where it's not just the, the small, um, withered peace movement 
that withered when Barack Obama came into power. We were quite vibrant uh, under the uh, Bush administration. So it's not just those of us who consider ourselves part of an anti-war movement. It is now uh, possible to make much larger alliances. And this is where I see the work around drones going as well. When I wrote this book about drones, uh, there had been a poll taken that showed that 83% of the American people thought it was just fine to use these drones to kill people who were terrorist suspects. So what is a suspect? Well, probably me, I'm guessing. Probably you. <laughs> So somebody who's never been convicted of anything, right? And I was astounded that 83% of the American people could agree with that. And that included Republicans, the majority of Democrats, the majority of people identified as, as liberal Democrats, and it included a majority of independents as well. And as we've been going out, uh, writing the book, going out and giving talks, building up more of a movement, seeing protests springing up at uh, bases around this country where the drones are operated, uh, at, uh, at universities like John Hopkins where there have been protests going on. So did everybody hear that? Tuesdays from 5.30 to 6.30 at 33rd and Charles. So please join with those. So as people are learning more about what was an extremely covert program that our government for many years refused to talk about, they are becoming uh, more and more skeptical and more and more opposed. So now the polls are more like 60%, which is quite a significant drop. And when you separate it by gender, the majority of women are now opposed to the use of drones to kill terrorist suspects. So yeah, let's give a hand to the women. So for those of you who don't know much about drones, buy the book. Uh, and in, in fact, that's an updated version of the book that just came out recently. And thank you to Verso Press for uh, encouraging me to update it quickly and get it out. And um, we go in the book through uh, what, are, what is a drone. And a drone, for anybody who doesn't know, can be anything that flies, that has a camera on it, that is relaying this information remotely. Uh, and the majority of drones are not used for killing purposes. There can be drones for good purposes, for uh, tracking endangered species, for helping to pinpoint forest fires. There are tremendous uh, possible commercial uses of drones. Many farmers would like to have drones to oversee their crops. Uh, there are uh, food services uh, that would like to use drones to send you your lunch. Um, there are um, uh, people who do uh, weather prediction who would like to use drones, journalists, all kinds of potential uses that are not necessarily bad. Uh, in the book, I focus on drones that are used for killing and for spying. And in terms of the drones used for killing, in case you didn't know it, uh, President Obama has really embraced drone warfare. It was used very infrequently under, Obama, uh, under Bush. Uh, under Bush, there were things like uh, picking people up and putting them in indefinite detention and black hole sites in Guantanamo, torture, extraordinary rendition. Obama came in and said, aha, I campaigned to close Guantanamo and torture. It wouldn't look good for me to pick these people up and do those kind of things for them, to them. Uh, and what was the option? Well, what, the option that they decided was to just kill them instead. And that's why drone, uh, the, the use of drones uh, really increased under the Obama administration. The Obama administration, uh, every Tuesdays, uh, has what's called Terror Tuesdays, come together in the White House with the aides, look at a list and nominate people to get put on the kill list, uh, and, uh, and then go out and kill them. There is another authority that the CIA and the military are given in addition to a kill list where you actually know who you're trying to kill, and that's called a signature strike, where they kill people just on the basis of suspicious activities. And that's where so many innocent people are getting killed. Now, we don't know how many people have been killed. Uh, Lindsey Graham, a senator who has a lot more uh, uh, um, uh, private information, secret information than I have, uh, said about six months ago that 4,700 people had been, been killed in drone strikes. 
Uh, and I don't think he was including Afghanistan. Uh, but we can only name less than 2% of the people who have been killed with drone strikes as having been on the high value target list. So the vast majority of people being killed are not high value Al Qaeda members. They are either low, low level Al Qaeda members, low level Taliban, or innocent people. Where are we using these drones? We're using them still in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. And what's very disturbing is to look at where drone bases are being set up, because they're being set up all over the Middle East, uh, including a place, uh, Saudi Arabia, which if any of you ever read why Osama bin Laden said he hated the United States, uh, top on the list was because the US had military bases in the Holy Lands in Saudi Arabia. Those bases were closed under the Bush administration. A new one reopened under the Obama administration to use as a drone base. And then there are drone bases that are dotting northern Africa, drone bases in the Seychelles, and Djibouti, and Ethiopia, and Burundi, and drone bases now being set up along the Pacific coast. So it gives you a sense that if we don't uh, rein in the drones, where they might be used. Um, in the case of Pakistan is where they've been used the most outside of uh, the open warfare in Afghanistan. And some of my colleagues and I actually took a trip to Pakistan to meet with drone victims. And we also met with somebody who is a, a photographer who risks his life to try to take pictures after they're the drone strikes. These are up in the tribal areas of Pakistan. He says that when you go to photograph the drone strikes, there are usually no bodies. The impact of the drones is so intense that the bodies are just vaporized. But what you find are pieces of flesh. They can be lying on the ground. They can be hanging from the trees. You find pieces of flesh, uh, but you can't find bodies. So the locals pick up the flesh and curse America. They say America is killing us inside our own country, inside our own homes, and only because we are Muslims. That is the perception of many of the people in the tribal areas in Pakistan. I go into great detail in the book about who are some of the victims, tell a number of those stories because it's so important to humanize these people. We never see in the mainstream press a picture of anybody who's been killed by a drone, killed by shrapnel from a drone, never hear directly the stories from the loved ones who have lost their family members from drones. And so it's hard for American people to get a real sense of how this affects communities. And what we found when we went to Pakistan, and this has been verified in a study done by two prestigious universities, the Stanford University and NY University Law Schools, that it's not just the number of people who are killed and wounded by the drones, it's also how communities are terrorized by the drones because they fly low, you can hear the buzzing of the drone, you can see the drones overhead, and you never know if they're going to strike, when they're going to strike, and who is going to get killed. And so people told us it's like having a bee inside your head that you can never get out of it, that buzzing, and that you think that that drone is for you. And no matter what you have done in your lifetime, nothing related to any extremist activity, you think you're gonna be in the wrong place in the wrong time. And that drone is gonna hit you when you're in the marketplace because it's meant for the person next to you, or it's gonna hit you when you're driving your car because it's meant for the car in front of you, or it's going to hit you when you're at some community activity like a wedding or a funeral or a community meeting. Uh, parents afraid to send their children to school because schools have been hit. And of course, so have homes been hit in the middle of the night. So they find many traumatized young people who are afraid to even go to sleep at night, a lot of bedwetting in this area. So uh, people have said to us, in our war against terror, we are terrorizing entire communities of people. In the book and, and in our travels, both to uh, Pakistan and later to Yemen, um, we have met all kinds of people who have told us all kinds of stories. And just to, to give you a, a little sense of, of the kinds of people we met, uh, in Yemen, uh, Taig and I met a, a very dignified, a uh, man from uh, a, a large tribal group whose brother had been driving a taxi 
Uh, that taxi picked up strangers, which taxis tend to do, and uh, uh, 10 minutes later, that taxi was blown up by a U.S. drone. And when this man came to tell us his story, he brought with him the children of his brother, who would never see his father, uh, their father again. He, would, he tried to bring his brother's wife, but she is uh, too distraught and spends her days sobbing and just couldn't come and tell the story. But he also told us that his tribe, which is a very large tribe, is very angry at the United States. And this is something that we hear all the time, that drone strikes create new enemies for the US. And he said that in his tribal culture, when you do something wrong, whether it's intentional or an accident, you have to atone for it. And we said, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, first of all, you have to acknowledge that you did it, which is something the United States has not done. Second of all, you have to apologize for what you did, which the United States has not done. And third of all, you should compensate the families for their loss, something that the United States refuses to do. And he said, could it be that our tribal culture is more involved than the U.S. government? sending out there into the world that we can kill anybody we want, anytime we want, 